Hey GQ, I'm Dr. Jordan Newen. I'm a biomedical engineer, inventor, and futurist, and this is part two of The Breakdown. In this episode, we'll be breaking down biomedical tech. Hi, robot. So this motor prosthetic design looks quite advanced. It obviously looks like an arm from the outside. And you see him having some form of super strength as well when he punches straight into the ground there. We're getting to the point in time where prosthetics and motor prosthetics and even exoskeletons can be built in a way that are actually becoming more and more functional and useful. And we're gonna see these advancements continue to occur. How Dell's uh, prosthetic arm would likely work is through a neural system where the electrical signals that his brain is trying to send out from the motor cortex is sending out those signals and he's in control of his arm whilst also getting feedback. This is already in some ways possible. The more rudimentary versions utilize uh, what's called EMG, electromyography, which can pick up on the electrical signals uh, that your brain is sending to the muscles. So we can pick up on those with electrodes as well. We can put them anywhere on the body to pick up the electrical signals and get an idea of what's going on. Then on top of that, we've got uh, EOG, electrooculography, which is the electrical signals of the eyes. Whenever we move our eyes, our brain sends electrical signals to the little muscles that push and pull them. That's something I utilized in uh, my documentary, Becoming Superhuman. My young friend Riley could only move his eyes. Uh, born with high level cerebral palsy, his dream was to drive a car. So we picked up on the electrical signals of his eyes to allow him to gain control over a vehicle literally with the electrical activity of his eyes. What Dell has here is not one of those simpler versions of the technology utilizing EMG to control the motor prosthetic. Instead, it's obviously built into his arm, built into the system. So he would have a technology that's picking up on the neural activity from inside uh, the brain and directly controlling the arm. With a motor prosthetic like Dell's here, you've got control of the fingers, the hand, the arms, probably a strong type of, uh, of material like titanium. So you could actually get what is effectively super strength. Uh, these are the sort of things that can be built already into exoskeletons where you wear uh, a suit on the outside of your body. And these have been utilized to allow people to lift weights that are already too heavy for them. These types of technologies can be lightweight, can be strong and can provide superhuman strength. There've been people who have had uh, motor prosthetics built for them that do have neural interfaces so that they are controlling it effectively with their mind. So this is already possible. It's just gonna keep advancing to get to this point that's seamless and looks like it's part of the body. The Matrix. This is the world that you know. The world as it was at the end of the 20th century. It exists now only as part of a neural interactive simulation that we call the Matrix. You've been living in a dream world, Neo. This whole backstory of the Matrix, the idea of artificial intelligence becoming on par with humans to the point where AI in robots uh, started getting to its own conscious level and deciding to have an uprising against the humans. The human body generates more bioelectricity than a 120 volt battery and over 25,000 BTUs of body heat. The human body does generate electricity or doesn't does generate energy. And so the robots chose to turn humans into a power source, into a battery. And to do that, they put us into these pods uh, and then they had to try and keep the mind active and alive. They built a virtual world, which is the world that we know today and injected it into our brain. There's a potential that we are living in a simulation. You can't prove that we're not. If we project a few decades into the future, we could create a virtual world that's so similar to the real world that we have today if it could also be combined with brain-computer interface technology where we can inject that virtual world into the brain, well, it's possible that this has already happened and we are living in a simulation. The Matrix is a computer-generated dream world built to keep us under control in order to change a human being into this. So this is a 
it's a freaky look at the, this dystopic future where humans have become batteries for the machines. We're living out our lives trapped in a virtual world that we don't even realize we're in. So how can you possibly escape? This scene in the movie leads on to Morpheus describing to Neo what is reality. And our reality, our individual reality, is a constant construction based on the electrical signals, the electrochemical signals, all our different senses sent to the brain. The brain is, it's there locked in a dark jar inside the skull and it's being sent these electrical signals and it uses that to construct our version of reality. Sight, smell, touch, taste, uh, and hearing. In the matrix, we go a step further to sensory injection where they plug this, this strange, uh, syringe-like plug into the back of the head and then it injects the whole virtual world, all the sensory information, everything directly into the brain. And that's how Neo and, uh, and Morpheus go straight into the virtual world and are just there existing inside this virtual space. Pacific Rim. Neural handshake strong and holding. Right hemisphere is calibrating. Left hemisphere calibrating. And I'll pause it there. I, I do like the Pacific Rim movies. I mean, you've got giant robots fighting giant aliens. What's not to like? So in Pacific Rim, you've got two pilots in unison controlling this large robot, the Jaeger, a, a neural interface that's picking up on the electrical signals of the brain and connecting the two pilots and then connecting them with the uh, with the actual robot that they're controlling, the Jaeger. They've also got, as you could see around their feet, they've got uh, haptic feedback and they've got these systems where they're actually mechanically pushing. So the movements that they're making are then being translated into uh, the robot and it's also getting feedback where they can feel the feedback and the, uh, uh, the forces that the robot is actually coming across. These are already used in real world systems, including in surgery. So they can do this thing called gearing as well, which is often used in, in surgery robots where the surgeon will be able to control these instruments and through their own movements can be turned into a robotic movement at a much finer and preciser level. A bigger movement uh, of the arms will translate into a tiny movement in the uh, in the actual surgical equipment. You could also have the uh, surgeon on the other side of the world controlling this robot in another location. There's so many different ways and methods that you can go about it. In this one, they seem to have uh, something built into their helmets that allows them to have this, this kind of neural connections. A couple of electrodes on the back of the head can pick up the tiny little electrical signals from outside the skull. From the outside of the skull, it's quite difficult to pick up on the accurate detail. And this is where uh, intelligent systems like artificial intelligence can help decode those signals. But being able to get further into the action by implanting uh, electrodes on the, say, the motor cortex of the brain, this is where you can get a brain-computer interface that has a much greater level of control. The fifth element. This was a futuristic take on how to fabricate a human body from the DNA. But what was interesting about this was it was actually a really good take on actually how a 3D printer tends to operate, where layer by layer, you have a printer with an extruder head being able to melt something like plastic polymer and print small layer by small layer, creating any three-dimensional object. 3D printing went from printing in, in plastics uh, to other areas as well. I've seen it scaled up to the point where it can print in concrete. And then more recently, it's moved into the space of what's called 3D bioprinting. So this is where the ink is used. The bio ink is actually built sometimes from uh, a human body, from human cells that can then print something like bone tissue. I've seen work done on, uh, on liver cells being printed, valves for the heart, even uh, movements towards trying to test out an entire artificial 3D printed heart. I've watched a 3D printer printing a, a type of skin um, 
uh, straight onto a person's arm, straight onto a wound. These experiments are happening around the world. The 3D printing of bone would actually be layer by layer, much finer layers than this. I love the, the scene where the, the muscles are being sort of dragged out and, and put across the body. I thought that was very creative. What you don't see in this, they skipped over it quite conveniently, is how the brain was created. I would have skipped over that in the making of this film as well because to do something like 3D print the brain is not going to happen anytime soon. Passengers. Multiple procedures are not recommended. Override! Do it now! Executing. Pretty cool thing, pretty cool idea, having having this, this medical pod that can do all of these different functions. It's a sci-fi possibility. When she goes through and she presses everything, I mean, she, she kind of pressed on everything to do with resuscitation. There was oxygenation, there was defibrillation. These things happen when you're trying to resuscitate a person. And the part that comes last is where uh, the electric shock is is given to the body. You often see them in movies where, you know, you've got your, your doctor go, charging the device and saying click they say clear because otherwise it will actually electrocute someone else if they're touching the person who's being defibrillated. What you're trying to do is to get the heart not only beating properly again, but it's got to beat back in rhythm. Having a medical pod like this would be something that I think many people would want to see. Medical equipment and biomedical equipment has moved into this space where autonomously they're operating and doing so many more features than ever before and there's more devices being created. Cinematically, this, this pod is beautiful and it would be great to see this type of medical uh, device created where it has all these different functions all built into it. What I do like about passengers is not just how this pod looks, it's the whole thing. I love so much about the designs of what has gone into the spaceship. It moves and rotates around its axis to create an artificial gravity like a centrifuge. And that's what creates that sort of artificial gravity. The spacecraft is more or less robotic and able to uh, automatically take itself through to the location, run different types of diagnostics on itself um, and uh, any failures that are happening. More broadly, looking at how a spacecraft would travel and find its way through space, uh, it's actually a very difficult thing to localize or locate yourself. If you move a sufficient distance away from the Earth, constellations will change and then they'll disappear. We won't be able to see that perspective on the universe anymore. And this has actually come up in many designs for the likes of space travel. If we send a probe outside of our own solar system, how is it going to ever find its way to where it's trying to get to? One of the uh, potential solutions is looking at pulsars. So sometimes when stars explode, these stars can often be around four to eight times the size of our own sun. When these stars explode, they leave this very solid uh, core and it's it's a very strong um, dense core and the core can be about the size of a city they beam out electromagnetic radiation and they spin because they're spinning and they're sending out radiation beams if those radiation beams flash across the earth they become like lighthouses so that if we know where those pulsars are across the galaxy it can be used to do things like localize a spacecraft that's even gone outside of our own solar system. This can become a wayfinding system for a galactic GPS. Ready player one. You don't need a destination when you're running on an omnidirectional treadmill with quadraphonic pressure sensitive underlay. James Halliday saw the future and then he built it. He gave us a place to go, a place called the Oasis. In this scene, Wade is in the back of a van. He's got this full virtual reality set up to allow him to go into the Oasis. In the late 80s, early 90s, we had uh, a boom in virtual reality technology. And my father, when I was young, he put a, a big headset on me. It gave me an incredible headache, but I could see it was the future. The technology died out while everyone focused on the rise of the internet. But it came back around 2012. 
uh, with Palmer Lucky and the Oculus Rift. What Wade is running on is called the Infinideck. It's actually a real uh, omnidirectional treadmill. But because when you go into the virtual world, you can't see really anything around you in the real world, uh, he's also being held up and this is, uh, is actually built into these omnidirectional treadmills to hold the person upright so they don't fall over. It's a fusion of many different types of sensory stimulation technologies to immerse the person into feeling and believing that they are in the virtual world. And this is the idea of virtual reality. Anything becomes possible. You go into the virtual world and you can create anything that your imagination can come up with. This is now moving into this space, which Ready Player One brings up is the idea of the metaverse. The metaverse is not any one location, any one application. What it is, is it's really starting to bring together different virtual worlds, and a lot of them can be linked by the ability to create the likes of avatars and move those between different virtual spaces. You know, jobs are going to go to the metaverse in the near future. We're gonna see many different types of work as well as gaming, as well as entertainment and all these other applications as well. What we're really seeing is virtual worlds and reality slowly intertwining. So it's going to come down to us individually as to how we decide to spend our time because balance is always gonna be key. We've got to find balance in our lives. Jurassic Park. This fossilized tree sap, which we call amber, waited for millions of years with the mosquito inside until Jurassic Park scientists came along. Using sophisticated techniques, they extract the preserved blood from the mosquito and bingo, dino DNA. And bingo, dino DNA. Where there's a problem with this particular clip is we don't have this level of, of DNA of dinosaurs. So unfortunately, the whole idea of having a Jurassic Park is, is still a pretty far-fetched one. Unfortunately, over 65 million years, those bits of DNA have degraded over time. Just imagine you've got a, a full jigsaw puzzle of a Tyrannosaurus Rex, and that's a thousand piece jigsaw puzzle. If you've been left over time losing pieces and only been left with 10 pieces out of this thousand, that's kind of representative of what we have of dino DNA. <laughs> There have been different efforts and one in particular has come up a lot more recently where some Harvard geneticists uh, were granted $15 million to bring back the woolly mammoth. From the DNA information that they do have, they've also got the closest living relative of the woolly mammoth, which is the Asian elephant. The idea that they're approaching it with is to, in iterative steps, uh, bring about a woolly mammoth elephant hybrid and to be able to edit the gene sequences in any way. This is a newer technology as well. It's called CRISPR-Cas9. CRISPR is a, um, they're basically sets of, of gene sequences and what it really is, is molecular scissors. So how CRISPR-Cas9 would be utilized in, in this particular space is by sequencing the genome of the Asian elephant, and then also getting the, the DNA sequences that they do have of the woolly mammoth and doing things like identifying the features that they need to pull out of the gene sequences of the Asian elephant and putting in the pieces of the woolly mammoth. This is where CRISPR-Cas9 gene editing is uh, starting to be used in these different types of applications. We've even seen uh, some experiments that have been starting up on human trials to find ways to, through the DNA, create healthier humans. But we're not going to see a full suite of, uh, of dinosaur clones coming back anytime soon. As we've seen with these references to biomedical technologies, they can be utilized for many advancements. Generally speaking, we wanna be able to shape these changes towards improving life, not only extension of life, but improving quality of life. So we've got to treat these movies as not only inspirations, but warnings for where things could go. And this is all part of helping us shape a better tomorrow. Thanks so much for watching these clips with me. I hope you learned something. It's definitely fascinating for me to go through as well. Until next time.